Excellent. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to this international technical we webinar. And thank you very much for joining. Um, today's webinar is on nutrition sensitive agriculture uh, and food systems. I just wanted to say a few words about our series of webinars. Um, we we uh, regularly deliver uh, uh, webinars on a number of thematic areas related to the global challenges, so related to climate change, related to uh, water and soils management, related to nutrition, to food systems. And these webinars are jointly organized by the, um, the FAO eLearning Academy, uh, Agrinium, and UNSCAP. Uh, this, uh, today's uh, webinar is also, however, um, organized in collaboration with our colleagues from the UN uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, uh, and they will also be um, collaborating and uh, organizing with us all the nutrition-related webinars this year uh, in 2021. 20, uh, so um, this year, we, uh, for, for this webinar, we have a, a very, very rich program organized. Uh, we have with us um, Patricia Fracassi, who is one, uh, a colleague from the, nutrition, the FAO Nutrition Division. We have with us Tokie Motswagole, who will be uh, sharing with us the experience from Botswana. Uh, Alfredo Echevarria, who will be talking to us about the linkages between food and sustainability, um, who he is from Costa Rica. And we are very, very pleased to have with us also um, Gerda Verben, who is the UN uh, Assistant Secretary General and also the coordinator of the Scaling Up uh, Nutrition Movement. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my, uh, to my colleague, Patricia Fracassi. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patrizia Fracassi and I lead the work on nutrition sensitive uh, policies and program support in the FAO Food and Nutrition Division. I'm here with my colleagues who will uh, respond to your uh, questions in the chat. We are here today to present our resources on uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture and uh, food system. And we will start by uh, sharing a short opening video on our e-learning courses. So the e-learning courses reflect three key features or quality. First, the content has been tailored to the competences and needs of three types of target audiences. Nutrition experts, professionals in nutrition-relevant sectors, and senior management. 
The content is designed to provide them with evidence, but also with inspiring examples and case studies. While the content is tailored to target audiences, it can be adapted to facilitate the uptake based on the context uh, of each uh, country and, um, and localities. Second, the e-learning courses build on the well-known toolkit developed specifically for policy advisors and program implementers. This easily adaptable toolkit includes four elements, the key recommendations, the checklist and guidance to operationalize the recommendations, the in-practice book with a list of 20 key interventions, and the compendium of indicator for nutrition sensitive uh, agriculture. The third quality is that both the toolkit and e-learning modules adopt a food systems approach that encompasses all functions from food production to food consumption. 20 interventions are identified as entry points, accord organized according to the functions of the food systems and cross-cutting issues including food quality, safety and hygiene, food loss and waste, woman empowerment and nutrition sensitive value chain. FAUS provides support to government and partners on project design, implementation and evaluation based on this entry point. Uh, for example, we collaborate on the global agriculture and food system program to uh, identify nutrition sensitive solutions within large scale investments. In 2020, uh, we developed a capacity development roadmap to support the implementation of FAO's uh, revised vision and strategy on nutrition. The objective of the uh, roadmap is to enhance member state capacities to design and implement context appropriate and evidence informed policies and actions that promote healthy diets for all from uh, sustainable, inclusive and resilient food systems. The food systems, uh, the, the capacity development roadmap looks at the individual and organizational level of capacity development, as well as the enabling environment. It considers four functional capacities. So it looks at policy and normative. It looks at knowledge for evidence-based decision-making. It looks at partnering, and it looks at implementation supported by human and financial resources. The capacity development roadmap was tailored for an internal audience within FAO, but also beyond. So in addition to government decision makers, we looked at innovative ways to engage non-state actors, including civil society organization and the private sector, in particular uh, small and medium enterprise, as well as parliamentarians. And we also recognize the importance of building effective uh, relationships with regional intergovernmental entities, national academia and research training institutes, and with other UN uh, and development partners. In 2020, uh, to support this work, we conducted a review of all capacity development activities within FAO at headquarter, regional and country level. Uh, what came out from this uh, review uh, was that most of the activity are concentrated at the level of national governments and focus on nutrition sensitive policies and programming. 
However, there are considerable opportunities to engage with other partners, uh, namely local government, parliamentarian, civil society organization, private sector, as well with a, a wide range of uh, topics, including market linkages and value chain, school food and nutrition, nutrition education and consumers awareness, and the cross-cutting topic of food loss and waste. Based on this review, we identified a number of priorities, which uh, we are looking for um, to increase uh, partnership. So looking at promoting the use of dietary indicators, uh, improving the evidence from an evaluation of food systems impact on diet, engaging the private sector, um, mostly the small and medium enterprises, as well as brokering inclusive dialogue with the recognition of the importance of civil society, uh, including consumers association, and uh, most importantly, looking at ways to adapt the capacity development resources and tailor them to the needs of different audiences. Finally, you will see, uh, and this is highlighted in blue, that uh, this cannot happen without building uh, the internal organizational capacity. And in FAO, we have a specific work, work stream called mainstreaming nutrition that looks at uh, internal capacity development process. So this is a very uh, brief um, overview of the capacity development roadmap which is really meant to support the uptake of our resources and work in collaboration with partners at country level. Here you will see the available resources. Also later, Christina will um, share them again with you, uh, with all the link. Uh, you can see that we have a lot of resources and we are really working and trying to identify ways uh, to increase the uptake. So we are looking for partners and we really hope that uh, this can be also an opportunity to, to, to learn from you. And uh, Christina, there was also a pool, I think, that was uh, put out to see the, uh, here it is. Okay. So Thank maybe you. Uh, you would like to ask participants to do the poll right now? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Patrizia. And um, I, I, I don't know if um, you, uh, you would like to wait for the results of the poll or you would like to... Uh... Let's wait maybe just one minute and a half and then Patricia can briefly comment on this poll and then you can move ahead with the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. I hope I was uh, within my time. <laughs> no, no, actually, you were perfectly on time. So we even have the time for to for the poll and to have a look at the at the results. Um, however, but this is probably going to take a little bit of time. So maybe I will ask uh, uh, Kate if you could uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Or you would like uh, Patricia? You would like to wait. For to 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 see the results. Maybe Patricia, you can start commenting on the poll now, and then I will close yes. it. I am not seeing the results. Sorry. Ah, so I will I, display I, it now. I will display it now. Okay. Seventy percent people <laughs> has commented. Hold on a second. Thank you so much. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> so you see, do not use. So that's really important to see. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm quite encouraged that people at least know about the resources. And uh, I think it will be great to, to find ways to, to be able to use the resources. Yes, uh, I think that um, the first thing to say is that these webinars are also a way to try to get, uh, to raise awareness of people about the courses that exist and the FAO uh, e-learning courses that are available on all these thematic areas. And as you say, Patricia, we need to maybe find other ways to increase a little bit the, uh, the uptake and the outreach. 
Okay, excellent. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I would like to give the floor now to, to Soki, who will be sharing with us the experience uh, in Botswana. So, uh, Soki, the floor is yours. You have about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you have to turn on your microphone. You're muted, Stoki. Yes. Okay, excellent. We see your presentation. Just now, maybe the the sound. All right. Thank you. Excellent. We hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting me to participate. And my presentation will be slightly different from what Patricia was presenting, but I think it's an experience worth sharing and colleagues can learn from our experience and maybe copy some of what we've done in what I'll be talking about today. My presentation will be focusing on describing how Botswana partnered with a UN agency in order to help in building a resilient and sustainable horticultural value chain. I'll just quickly run through my first slide, which gives the elements, shows the elements of the food system and a, def a definition of nutrition sensitive agriculture. As we see, this is similar to what Patricia was showing on the food system. There are various players in the system. And when you talk about nutrition sensitive agriculture, we are referring to a production system that ensures that we get a variety of food, which is affordable, nutritious, culturally appropriate, safe, adequate in terms of quantity and quality to meet the dietary requirements of a population in a sustainable manner. The definition is somewhat very, very much similar to a definition of food security. So the fact that we have so many players in the food system provides an opportunity for us to intervene at any convenient point. So if you want to develop a resilient and sustainable food system, we have to be able to identify opportunities for meaningful entry into the system so that we can intervene in each context and center a sector and obtain so that we obtain suitable or sustainable outcomes and impact. And you see the portion on food handling and storage there is highlighted. And I've highlighted it because I will be sharing with you, focusing on how food processing was used and as an ent entry point in our, our partnership with an UN agency. And we'll be describing on how it has contributed to understanding the horticultural value chain in Botswana and has helped us come up with recommendations on how to improve and build a resilient and sustainable value chain. So I'll be focusing on a bit, I'll be talking a bit on processing. Now, just to, to give you an overview, Botswana's economy is mainly dependent on the mineral sector with minimal economic diversification and underperforming agricultural sector and all these results in dependence of food imports that compromises food security and employment generation. However, through the development of our own value chains, including intensified value addition of produce, we can position the country Botswana to lower its expenditure on food imports and increase agricultural productivity. Consequently, the creation of the much needed employment opportunities and eradication of poverty, increased farmers' returns could be realized. From time immemorial, our farmers were growing mostly cereals and legumes, and thus limiting the diversity of locally grown available foods. In realizing the importance of good nutrition, 
the government is now actively promoting the development of every sector in agriculture, including horticulture. Now, I want to take you through, just to give you an overview of how the horticultural sector is in Botswana. It is mostly dominated by small and profitable farmers who in most instances lack resources to invest in modern farming technologies. And because they don't have the resources, they lack the lack of technology restricts the opportunity to expand both the range and the volume of, the, of their produce. The sector is also dominated by farmers who are part-time. They come and go at the farm, so this limits the farm reduces the farm performance. Inputs are sourced from South Africa, and this is a challenge, and this challenge was really felt during this COVID era because of border closures and movement, restriction movement. So getting stuff from South Africa has been very, very difficult. And there's also seasonality and large fluctuations of supplies, which leads to large variation in prices and wastage. Data from the Ministry of Agriculture indicates that 50% of the land allocated to horticulture remains unutilized, therefore reducing production potential. We also have significant fluctuations in production volumes and prices of fresh fruits and vegetables due to accentu accentuated seasons and extreme weather conditions. And of course, there's limited cooperation between the farmers themselves to coordinate production or group for marketing or purchasing purposes. So this just shows you the landscape of what transpires in our Botswana horticultural sector. Now, notwithstanding that, I want at this point to highlight that fact, the fact that Botswana is currently working or collaborating with partners to collectively step up support to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Some of these include the signing up with the Sun Movement, which currently has five networks existing in the country, although they are not yet, they have not yet gained momentum. We've also had an opportunity to participate in the Compact 2025 initiative through IFPRI. And we managed to conduct a nutrition scoping study, which is still ongoing, results of which would be disseminated in June 2021. So having said that, in my next slide now, I'll be describing on the specific joint venture targeting the horticultural value chain, as I said at the beginning of the presentation. In this slide, I'm showing you in 2016, our institution, which is a food research institution responsible for developing food processing technologies, established an agro-processing plant as a spin-off company with the aim of saving the produce and this saving the produce from the farmers, which could not sell fresh at the market. And this company is currently producing vegetable pickles and tomato sauces. As you can see from those pictures, the brand name is Harvest Haven, and we produce pickled beetroot, pickled vegetable, mixed veg vegetable pickle, and tomato chili sauce, and we also have plain sauce. Now, the other objectives besides saving the produce from the farmers was to stimulate growth within the horticultural sector itself. And the plant was also established as a development project to be operated as a commercially sustainable business and also a demonstration model of a sustainable ag agro-processing enterprise to be replicated in Botswana as espoused by stakeholders. The established plant and operations infrastructure also serve as an enabler, an incentive for potential investment in the company to facilitate growth and expansion. So three years down the line, after starting the company, we were approached by UNDP and they were requesting for partnership 
for us to participate in a program called Botswana Business Supplier Development Program. This program is aimed at creating demand-based market-driven opportunities for small and medium enterprises in order to increase their competitiveness while connecting them to larger markets locally as, as well as abroad. Now, this program uses a, a, a three-stage business methodology, which ensures that the supplier can supply the buyer with the goods to the standard required. So what happens is that the UNDP and our institution signed an agreement and a partnership. And in this agreement, UNDP was committing to engaging consultants to work with the different players in the value, on the value chain, while our institution was committing to sourcing the resources that would be needed in addressing the issues identified through this partnership. So UNDP engaged consultants who were trained on this method methodology and assigned to work with each player in the value chain to establish the issues on the ground so that we understand better what is happening within the value chain. And therefore, when you know what is wrong with something, it's only then that you can come up with interventions to mitigate the challenges that you are facing. Now, the set of consultants who were working with the farmers on the production side identified a few challenges that were facing the farmers. First of all, the farmers were not motivated to diversify their produce due to lack of markets. If you don't have anywhere to sell, you are not motivated to produce. Some farmers were not grading their produce, whatever they produce, when they want to sell, they just lump everything together and try to take it to the market. As mentioned earlier, limitations of technology and not using best farming practices, therefore, really the production is not up to standard. The produce, the farmers produce on open fields because they have, they don't have the extra infrastructure for climate control. And as we are all aware, climate change is now affecting a lot of us to an extent that we farmers sometimes lose their produce because of frost or because of too much heat. There's lack of access to improved seed, and seed varieties and agrochemicals. And our farmers are not using efficient harvesting and preservation methods. Also storage is a challenge and then Ultimately, all this leads to low production output and perishability of farm produce. So in a nutshell, those were the key challenges that were identified by the consultants, and these are the challenges that the farmers are, are facing. Now, when it comes to the plant itself, looking at the processing, the plant had limitations related to capacity on some of the installed equipment in relation to anticipated product offtake. Remember, we, we, were, we bought the equipment from India, and therefore there were some challenges with the equipment that we had bought. The plant was, is also not at a point where it can absorb all the produce from the farmers, which means it is failing to, to provide a one-stop shop for all the horticultural produce potentially available or potentially produced by our horticultural farmers. And with the current capacity limitations, the plant still does not provide farmers with optimal access to alternative and competitive markets that can cause them to, ex to expand their production. The plant was also experiencing challenges with product quality. The, the products were not stabilized. There were points where some product has to be recalled from the shop shelves because it was not performing very well. So those are the challenges the plant was experiencing. When it gets, got to the marketing component or the market player in the food value chain, the horticultural value chain, when we set up the, the plant, we had a marketing plan. But unfortunately, due to lack of resources, we could not implement this plan. Our products were facing difficulties in penetrating the market. 
we have limited product offering and this is affecting the income generated by the plant and therefore the plant is not sustaining itself the products are facing a lot of competition from established brands like i was saying we get most of our foods from south africa so our people still believe the products from south africa are better than the locally produced products we were limited to only one promotion strategies and we were using merchandisers in shops to to promote the products and we could not use the existing channels of wholesale distribution because it was too expensive 35 percent of the distribution cost on the sale price and that was going to put the price of our products very high and therefore not competitive in the market the last player that we looked at was the consumers themselves of the products. In Botswana, there's lack of information about consumer behavior. And without this information, we are limited in terms of understanding the consumer actions that drive them to buy and use certain products. We also have limited understanding of the expectations of the consumers and what makes the consumer buy the product. So in a nutshell, these were the challenges that were identified during this partnership, working with these four different players in the horticultural value chain. The project did not end there. We then went a step further to now come up with interventions. How do we now address the identified challenges which are facing the different players in the horticultural value chain with the sole aim of trying to make the value chain perform much better than it is performing right now. From the farmer side, training was uh, identified as a key area where we should be focusing. And the training of farmers should be able to provide answers to what type of agriculture is feasible within the current climate change environment, what kind of effective technologies and corporate mix can the farmers engage in in order to give them op optimum economic returns, and what are the quality control issues that can hinge on the cooperation of both the, the growers and the buyers and ensure the quality of the project, the product. And I'm quite happy to say UNDP is working on that component that we do get our farmers trained so that they can improve their production capacity. On the plant side, this was now the responsibility of our institution because we had committed to raising funds to fund any productivity improvements or enhancement within the plant itself. And we thought, first and foremost, we need to increase our product range. And we could only do that by an additional line, processing line. And for starters, we are thinking of the dry soup line and canning line. The canning line is quite versatile. In the future, we can be able to can quite a number of products so that we increase the income for, we increase our product offering and therefore possibly increase the, the income generated by, <clears throat> by the plant. We also have secured funds for setting up a quality control lab. Like I mentioned earlier, the product where we are experiencing issues of quality with the product. So because there was a, no on-site lab, we are depending on an external lab to do our testing for us. So we have established a quality, we are in the process of establishing a quality control lab, which is going to take control of stabilizing the, the product and make sure that it is of the quality that is required. Also, we are going to be making sure that we improve product availability there for the issues of distributing the products, warehousing, we are going to be looking into it and also incorporating an internal quality assurance system in the management structures of the, of the institution, of the plan. The market, like I said, we are introducing another line that is basically to, to make us penetrate into other segments of the market, other market segments, especially the institutional market. Institutions here, I'm referring to institutions like schools, hospitals, prisons, et cetera, et cetera. If we can make products that can sell in those markets, it could help the, the income generation by the project. And we also secured some funding for marketing activities. 
and we are currently working on developing promotional materials which can use to push the products from the shop, shop shelves. Lastly, now the consumers, we are planning to do more product promotions in shops and more consumer acceptance tests of the products that will be introduced. And we are also riding on a national initiative for promoting locally produced goods, which is called hashtag push up BW. If you have that in your, in, on your, your label, people are able, able to identify with that product and maybe buy it better than they are doing right now. So we are riding on that national initiative. In conclusion, we know that Botswana is now committed to improving the nutritional status of the population, but we need to strengthen the agriculture and nutrition linkages. Through this partnership, we have realized that and understood the issues affecting the horticultural value chain. And we've also realized that when you harness the strengths and abilities of others from different corners of your ecosystem, that is the one of the most strategic ways for businesses to scale up their innovation, solve complex challenges, and learn very useful lessons for development of the future of the agro-processing facility in this particular context. So in a nutshell, investing in agriculture and food systems through public and private investment towards agro-processing can support goals of diversifying livelihoods and the economy at large. Thank you very much for listening. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you, thank you very much, Soki. It was really very, very interested and interesting, and also uh, the importance of adopting an integrated approach to to food systems. The the importance of of uh, going local on, on supporting local uh, social economic ecosystems. The importance of having um, value chains which are more sustainable, which try to reduce food losses, which are more integrated, and of course, more nutrition sensitive. Now, really, it was very, very interesting. Thank you very, very much. I would like now to give the floor to Alfredo Echevarria, who will be give, sharing with, uh, with, uh, with us his experience uh, from Costa Rica. Uh, Alfredo, the floor is yours. You have about 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, hello. Yes, just a moment, please. Yes, hi. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to FAO, to SON, to everybody that make this happen. Well, I, I am come from Costa Rica, the, the land of Pura Vida, which in Spain in English is, is, is pure life. And I represent the Costa Rica uh, Gastronomic Foundation. We are 5.1 million inhabitants. Uh, the highest percentage of biodiversity per square meter, which is awesome in the world. And uh, that uh, creates a great sustainability consciousness of, of, of our people. But we have challenges. We have 1.8 mile nutrition. Uh, and 25.7 obesity. But from challenges, we, we have opportunities. And today I'm here to talk about the National Plan for Sustainable and Healthy Gastronomy. And I have two topics. The number one is raising the bar on the general understanding of the definition of gastronomy. Uh, we're gonna be talking about gastronomy and let's make it clear. We want to uh, upgrade uh, up, you know, this, this term. Second point is working horizontally, meaning using gastronomy, the term that we're going to define as a cross cutting axis towards cultural, socioeconomic uh, development. So let's go to topic number one raising the bar on the general definition of, of gastronomy. Usually gastronomy, uh, I, I, uh, we see it as two vertical. And this means that uh, the definition usually is related to food and culture, but also to gourmet cuisine. And we want to raise the bar and, 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 and talk about a more deep uh, definition. This is the Berkeley University of California definition. And let, let's put it this way. Um, 
the, the way I see it is this one dimension only is, is the perception that has been. And let me let me just go through. For example, from the culinary field, we see mostly related to the quality of the product. The chefs are very much uh, in care of, of obtaining the best product to prepare the best meal. That's understandable. The trade institutions, exports and imports, tourism organizations, product enhancement, uh, cultural entities, intangible heritage value mean tradition, restaurants, private business, enhance experience and, and profit, uh, planning institutions, food security, health departments, health related issues, like for example, the reduction of salt and the agriculture departments, food production, and we can continue, continue, and the list is, the list is big. But what if we put all this together in one definition? Um, so we have to go to basics. And what is basic? Basic usually comes in, in uh, uh, from, from history. Uh, Briat Savaran, a French um, um, uh, he, he wrote the physiology of taste. He is the anthropologist of gastronomy. He's the, the first philosopher of gastronomy. He wrote, gastronomy is the knowledge and understanding of all that relates to man as he eats. Its purpose is to ensure the conservation, watch this word, of man using the best, best policy uh, food possible. So, in those definitions, sustainability, nutrition, food systems, innovation with identity, which are using the present time, responsible production, agrodiversity, value chain, all those words were not there at that time. But in those two words, conservation and best food, we might see the basic of it. And uh, let's talk about an inspirational and enhanced ideal of definition of gastronomy in which all stakeholders should be represented. For example, gastronomy is the sustainable and healthy food, good food, nutritious, that people consume, both traditional and innovative with identity, Mean, meaning uh, the new, the contemporary food, we recommend to be inspired in tradition. So it is innovative, but it comes from the values and tradition. But this food that nurtures and strengthens the quality and joy of living, we must have fun while thinking on, on, on food. Also cultural values and agro-biodiversity. This, this means going to from responsible production to accessible consumption, uh, impacting the food systems towards the resilience to climate change and thinking about the future thus proactively contributing to the well-being of future generations. So, so, so I leave you with this definition that we think embodied uh, the whole spectrum. Because we, we think that this goes, has to go beyond pleasure on the plate. It, the, the whole food system should be in the world. The whole food system should be in the plate. When you see, when, when we have food in front of us, we, we, we should be able to think about the complete food system that created that, that we have in front of us. It's a more holistic view of gastronomy in which definitely, definitely uh, sustainability and health, nutrition should be the first talking point. And let's go to topic number two. And this is the National Plan for Sustainable and Healthy Gastronomy. It's a long, long title, but let me explain. Uh, we, uh, we call it the National Gastronomic Round Table. Why national? Because everybody should be involved. Why gastronomy? Because it's the common denominator. Food is life. Food is common to everybody. Everybody can relate to food. Why round? Because we want no head, no hierarchies, no politics. We want everybody to be there. Why table? Because table is where family gathers. Table is where, where we nurture. So when did we start this? We started in 2011 uh, and it was an initiative of civil society. And yes, government, private sector, and academia are represented. We are just one group. 
we have right now 52 entities that we call adherents. And for 2021, we have a goal which is reached to 100. Yes, challenging, but doable. So who we really are, our DNA is a multi-stakeholders articulation model that envision gastronomy as a cross-cutting axis toward the cultural and socioeconomic development in our country. And let, let's put it this way. This is a result of many, many, many people working for, for, for uh, as you see, from 2011. It's a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, consistent and passionate effort from many colleagues and founders. We are six founders, uh, but, but just many, many, many people from all spectrum of society uh, working with this. Also, it's an innovative approach by which food systems are benefit from. So what keeps us going strong because we're growing? First of all, passion and commitment, visualization and visualization of stakeholders. This is key. And those concepts are different. Pledge to principles, which are sustainability and health. We, we, we have that as, a, as an umbrella. And every, 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 every institution, every entity that sits on our table, we ask, what is your contribution to the table? Meaning, what is not you coming to look for? What is your contribution? Thinking about uh, sustainability, health, and having gastronomy as the axis. So we look for consistency uh, in, the, in the implementation of these principles, uh, compliance, and therefore accountability. Right now we are looking forward and we're working on that area in Costa Rica. Uh, and here we are, uh, 50 plus stakeholders, um, as a matter of fact, I am right now in the convention center, uh, the place that you're looking at in the screen. Um, I, we are a working in a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder alliance for the implementation of the plan. But then we're building bridges to ex expedite articulation. We want action. We want facts. We want to, to really make things happen. So the way we look, this is the following. You're going to have uh, here um, a little bit of uh, animation here. So the stakeholders sit around the table and you see gastronomy in the middle because it's our center of attention. Remember, we said put gastronomy as the, as the axis, the, the, what, this unite everybody. Who is everybody? Well, the health department and related institutions, tourism, hospitality sector. We have the labor department. We have the gastronomic sector, key, the chefs, the culinary professionals, the community, uh, public and private academia and research, uh, the culture department, the local governments, the municipalities, uh, ONGs, uh, social society. Uh, ONGs belongs to social society, but we wanted to point it out a little bit higher. and economy department and agriculture department, everybody. But you know what happens? When we are seated together, then we can start talking and sharing. And then what happens, it, it's magic. It's magic because then you recognize somebody in front of you that has uh, maybe uh, an objective and has uh, a project and also frustrations because I mean, life is life. And then we recognize our strengths and our possibilities. And then we start to talk and then triangulate. And this is magic. And this is happening right now. We are talking to everybody at the same level in that table. And then we said achie achievements. What, what, what have we achieved? Well, first of all, um, um, when this is a book. Yeah, and it was uh, published by Inbio, which is a leading cutting edge institution in Costa Rica that we love in, in biodiversity studies. Um, this book is, has 106 uh, approximately uh, edible plants from Central America, but we need it. I mean, the people from, the, from, 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 from society, the people from operations, the people from the field, we needed a tangible platform, scientific in this case. So, this created a visualization of local native, native plants as a nutritious ingredient uh, and as a cultural heritage value. So if we use the native and local plants and we build on that, then everything is a chain reaction. Okay, we were able to do that. 
um, many actions that uh, in 2015 uh, led to the um, declaration of by presidential decree of the initiative uh, of national interest. This was thanks to um, Kakore, which is a, um, a restaurant chamber of uh, Costa Rica. Um, this opens doors to to talk to other uh, uh, institutions in the government that really, really absolutely help us. And also we were able to promote sustainable and healthy gastronomic business models and helping the creation of new jobs directly and indirectly because this created a movement. And the inclusion of Costa Rica gastronomy in private and public hospitality and culinary educational programs. So we, we, we really affected the, the, the academic uh, uh, perspective. Before 2011, there were none uh, uh, public or uh, private institutions that were really, really in terms of, of culinary practice, uh, putting the Costa Rican gastronomy uh, uh, as a main topic. We were talking about other other success stories like you know France and Italy and Spain and many others no so this this was a really a, a, a real achievement also uh, we were and this is happening right now I mean uh, we have energized a nationwide movement promoting regional tourism product differentiation based on local gastronomy so different uh, uh, regions are really looking for looking to from from within i mean going local and we took the term um, globalization. Uh, watch that this is different from globalization and this is a term that i understand started in japan in 1970 um, it means think global but act local and we are implementing that so uh other success story is the evaluation of phytogenetic resources for food and agriculture in a mega diverse country i mentioned at the beginning that we have the highest percentage of biodiversity per square meter in the world uh, can you imagine this so we have these these resources and it, 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 there are many many institutions in costa rica that are doing an extraordinary job but the thing is that we were not talking to each other so what happened when you again you do this and then you suddenly you um shorten the market commercial, commercialization chains so you bring food producers closest to the gastronomic sector you, you eliminate those those chains and when producers and restaurants get together you know again magic starts to happen <laughs> so another achievement here is uh, we we have widened society awareness towards sustainable innovative and healthy gastronomy and I mean, we, I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, all the stakeholders from different uh, levels of society are working together. In, in this picture, you, you, you see here um, from, from the ICT board that we're very closely, very, very close. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a meeting next week with the minister to, to work together to see what are we going to do in the next two years together. So. Uh, the awareness towards sustainable, innovative, and healthy gastronomy. And healthy is a word that we want to really emphasize. And we done this through um, communities, farmers, markets that are members of our uh, initiative, meaning ad adherents. Um, and I mentioned the tourism development program and food festivals uh, in 2015 uh, we started organizing festivals it, with those values included it's not just remember to to talk about gastronomy as an entertaining or as a hedonistic uh, way of enjoying life it's just looking to those values within the term and also not only the term the actions as I said, food festivals. We did food festivals that suddenly, uh, I, I, I had the pleasure of organizing the first one, and we had 15,000 people in one day. And then we had another one with 25,000 people and another one with 50,000 people. So this is coming exponentially. Uh, uh, pandemia obviously st stopped us, no? Also, we started the gastronomic routes in the central market. And I have the pleasure even to, um, to go with, um, 
uh, Miss Gerda Berburg that went uh, two years ago, was there. I had the pleasure of going through these routes in the central market. Culinary labs, again, organized by the Chamber of, of Restaurants. Uh, we had until 150 restaurants, up to uh, more than 120,000 people reach with new dishes that include uh, native plants and also a, a, a nutritional balance and all these concepts within the, the, re the recipes. But also we have reached private and public schools canteens because remember, this is not only for restaurants. Again, uh, gastronomy is, is, is a much more wider and bigger uh, term. Okay, this is, this is, this is great. Um, one of the, I, I would say, I, we're very proud of reaching this stage because we have uh, joined recently or the, the Latin America and Caribbean Civil Society Network for the Sun Movement. Because um, working towards the eradication of malnutrition in Costa Rica, um, we have a, a obesity uh, challenge. Uh, one of the fastest growing percentages in, in Latin America. And, and, and then again, uh, uh, putting this in the, in the point of the spear, is for us of, of critical, critical uh, in, in terms of where we're going and where we're heading. So where are we heading and where, where, where do we come from? Well, talking about the sustainable development goals, um, with this initiative, we have clearly pointed the areas that we have impacted. And let me sum up. First, poverty. Uh I'm Zero. afraid, yes, you will have to, to, uh, to resume very soon and you have to conclude very soon because uh, the time is... Uh, yes, is... yes. Well, we have just uh, reached the Sustainable Development Goals and I am finishing. This is the last one, which I'll say that uh, all together is the only way to achieve the goals and through sustainable and healthy gastronomy. And thank you and Pura Vida the way we say it in Costa Rica. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for underlying the importance of shortening the food value chains, uh, using local products, and also putting at the center the health and nutritional status of individuals in the center of everything. Uh, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I would like to now give the floor to uh, Patricia to answer uh, some of the questions she has received. Meanwhile, uh, please, to the others, for the other speakers, please have a look at the Q&A uh, to see the questions that were addressed to you, and later on you will have the opportunity to answer. So, Patricia, uh, would you like to answer some of the questions? Yes, I, I would like to answer um, one question. Uh, I think a couple of questions were uh, um, asking how they can get in touch with us. And um, I just want to build on what uh, Alfredo uh, said. Uh, in relation to uh, network, for example, the Sun Civil Society Network, uh, because uh, clearly for us, it would be easier to work with networks and, uh, and adjust uh, the, the resources that we have to um, make them suitable and tailored to, to different audiences. So um, in, I'm, I'm taking the example of the Sun Civil Society Network that uh, works with a wide range of partner. Uh, in that case, uh, they know uh, better what are the, the needs um, and, and what is the format that they want to use. And by, by working with, uh, with them, we would be uh, in a better position to, to collaborate and, uh, and to tailor the material. Uh, because the, I mean, you will see that these e-learning courses were designed for individual capacity development. Uh, so they are really tailored for individual learning. And, and now to translate all this knowledge into um, something, a format that can be used with the civil society organization or with small and medium enterprise, you then need to, to tailor the material in a different format uh, using you know, much more videos or uh, inspirational talk like the one that we had uh, just now. So, I mean, in, in short, uh, how to get in contact, it's easier for us to get in contact through existing network like the Sun, 
uh, it's great to think about different uh, formats together. And for individual learning, we really encourage you to go and take these e-learning courses because you can get a qualification, a badge from them, and you can really uh, know what is the content to further adapt uh, that contact, content. So that was uh, one of the questions that I received. Uh, another question was on the uh, organizational capacity that are needed to mainstreaming nutrition in uh, large scale investment. And um, again, I mean, it's a very broad question, but it's, it's a very uh, interesting question. And uh, there are two uh, entry points. I mean, one is to understand what is the buy-in from the, from the senior uh, management, because often uh, changes in an organization uh, can start if there is a buy-in at, at the level of the leadership or at least an endorsement. And then at the technical level, we look at two types of competences. I mean, obviously, if there is nutrition expertise that's uh, of value, but also we look at uh, professionals that are working in nutrition relevant areas. So it means uh, people that are working on agriculture, horticulture, uh, even gastronomy. I mean, really different areas that uh, really can help to, to have that uh, multidisciplinarity. But uh, it's, it's really at two levels, at the technical level, but also at the leadership level that you, can, uh, that you need to have these two entry points. So I just took these two questions to start with. OK, thank you very much. Um, now, maybe, uh, Stokhi, did you have a chance to look at, at your questions? Would you like to uh, provide some answers? Yes, thank you. I'll answer to a few questions, and some of them I will have to type in the answers. Uh, the first question that I got was on how we are promoting our pickled vegetable product. Normally, the promotion strategy that we use is we talk to shops where we, we, we have our product to put them in special. They have, we call them, call them month end specials. So in that way, they'll be slight, they become slightly cheaper than the normal price. But then if we push enough volumes, we normally get sufficient or quite reasonable funding from, from that. And we also do on-site tasting in the shops. The merchandisers that I said we are engaging sit in shops and they always put a table there with the product. So when customers come into the shops, they make them taste the product. And normally after tasting, one would pick one or two bottles to take home. So that is how we've been promoting our pickled vegetable product. Another question was on nutrition objectives on what we did. If we remember very well, I said nutrition sensitive means having a variety of foods and variety obviously is a nutrition objective and also stimulating production. Remember we said the food should be sufficient in terms of quantity and quality. So those are nutrition objectives which were embedded in the product. So food security in terms of the quantity of what the farmers are producing, and then diversity, because now they are no more just producing sorghum and beans. They can now produce carrots, cabbage, onion, beetroot, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives us the, the variety that we need and also the quantity. And of course, contributing to food security in Botswana, because supposing South Africa does it stops giving, giving us food or it closes their borders so that we don't get from there we will starve. But if you have our local production, then we can be able to feed our own people and it's a nutrition objective. There was also another question on the willingness of farmers to use modern technologies. Yes, as I said, there, 
there are consultants who are working with the farmers as I'm speaking. And one of what we have been pushing for is we've been negotiating with the Ministry of Infrastructure Development to take the necessary infrastructure to the farms because we find that our farms would be in the bush, there'll be no electricity, there'll be no telephone, there'll be no this, there'll be no that. So we are working with the Ministry of Infrastructure, the Ministry of Mineral Resources and Energy so that they can take the services to the people where they need them so that our farms would have electricity to operate. And they will also have things like, like telephone lines, they can get internet connection so that it makes it easier for the farmers to communicate with the, with the market. And then there was another question on whether our farmers are using commercial varieties. They are growing commercial varieties. Like I mentioned in my presentation, the farmers are now, UNDP is engaging the, the, the consultants to teach the farmers on, on the fact that they should always test their soils so that they know what is lacking, what nutrient is lacking, and also to know what type of vegetable would be suitable for their soils. They are also testing waters from either the river if they are irrigating from the river, or if they are irrigating using their borehole to test their borehole water so that you know the status of the water and therefore can use appropriate seeds. And we are also working with the Department of Agricultural Research so that the farmers do get information on what is suitable for their, their farms. And then also the last one that I will respond to is on agro-processing for small and medium enterprises, whether that is sustainable or that is, yeah, whether it was sustainable or what, yeah, something like that. Finish agro product development and marketing by small and medium entrepreneurs may not be sustainable. Yes, I agree, it may not be sustainable if you look into the issue of equipment. Equipment is normally expensive. And like I said, our farms, there would be no services like electricity. So if you buy an electric run machine, where will you get the electricity from to, to run it? But what we do is, we have, we have test beds or mini processing plant so that a farmer can list out the mini processing or we can make an agreement, a deal, so that they hire the use of this mini processing plant. They come in, process their product and take it to the market. In, in the initial stages, we were promoting the use of these mini plants just for market testing of the product before you get into any meaningful investment. But we are now saying, if you cannot afford to, to buy the necessary equipment and all that, you can come to us, do, we, we sign a contract, you come in, you process your, 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 your product, you take it to the market for selling, and we can have the, the agreement for as, as long as the entrepreneur is interested to, to have, or as long as you generate enough resources for you to now be able to purchase your own equipment. That is what I will say for now. The rest of the answers I can provide at a later stage by typing them in. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you very much. There is a question that says the Costa Rica ranks in sixth in the 2020 Global Hunger Index Report with a consistent good score over the past four rankings. The question is, which part of the food systems will you attribute to the improved outcomes? And what, what will you advise countries seeking to improve their score to implement uh, as best practices? I will start saying that uh, this is not by chance. Costa Rica have invested in, 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 in social in the social dimension since so many, many, many years ago. Remember, we do not have uh, an army by in itself, and uh, we have been able to invest in, 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 in the social dimension, as I said. Um, we have a very strong uh, health uh, system, 
uh, and I have to say that um, with very proudly that the, uh, the the health department, the education department, and the social security, which belongs to the health department, have done an extraordinary job by recognize. I mean, by analyzing um, um, uh, hunger, and they have made an. Uh, um, they studied really the country and they, for example, as I understand, uh, they have uh, concluded that there are up to date up, uh, around 6,000 families that are on the level of uh, high level of poverty, lower, and they're working with them. So in that way, um, the situation in Costa Rica is, is as I said at the beginning, is 1.7, uh, 1.8 of malnutrition. But really, maybe we have to look for uh, obesity, which is a pandemic, which is just growing. I mean, we have a situation here and, and how to teach people how, to, how they can learn how to eat better. So, but again, going to the question, um, the social uh, dimension of our uh, society and, and uh, the, the, the health department and the, the health system has been very strong. And again, there's another question here and uh, that help us to really reach uh, other areas uh, because um, it, it says here, for example, uh, if the street food sector was also integrated with within these initiatives. Well, we, we have started in 2011 with this plan and uh, yes, it's been tough in terms of communicating, but we're, we're getting there. What we've been doing is is building this this platform, this this integrated uh, platform of stakeholders, and yes, we have worked, for example, uh, with the uh, with the with the market, the, with different markets, and and uh, by communicating and by doing, for example, uh, the festivals, we're integrating uh, the people, and and also the municipalities right now are getting into the, the initiative and, and, and we are working on, for example, the, the, food sec the, the street food sector. Um, and let me see, there's another question here. Well, I, what I would say that uh, the, the key th here is integrating and is informing and is involved in visualizing the stakeholders. Through, through the national plan and through uh, inviting people and seating. And also uh, I have to say that the uh, different uh, organizations like the chamber of uh, restaurant chamber uh, have uh, by including the chambers also, the professional uh, within the, the initiative, then we are able to spread the news to communicate and to integrate others. I hope that I answer. I have answered the questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo. I would like to thank all the speakers. And before we resume, I would like to um, to mention that the FAO e-learning courses that are offered through the FAO e-learning academy, as Patricia was were, was mentioning, uh, are all um, multilingual. First of all, they are free and offered as a global public good, and they are certified through the digital badge uh, certification system. So uh, this system certifies the acquisition of competences. They are very much, the courses we produce are very much competency-based and the digital badge system that we adopt for certification is based also on the acquisition of, of competences. So this was just um, to, uh, to go back to what Patricia has said and to uh, mention, to uh, maybe have a look at the list of courses which are related to this webinar. Uh, as a conclusion, we are extremely lucky and very, very pleased to have with us also um, Gerda Verbrun from uh, the U who is the United Nations the Assistant Secretary General and also the coordinator of the Sun uh, Movement, uh, the Scaling Up um, uh, Nutrition Movement. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity also to thank very much the team of the Sun Movement with whom I am in contact uh, and with whom we work very, very successfully. So Gerda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christiana. Um, it is really an honor and pleasure to join you and all the 260, uh, um, 65, 66 
participants and it, it has been even more participants. So I would like to congratulate you, um, the FAO team and the Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Movement team, but also all the participants. Because apparently these kind of e-learning uh, um, uh, courses on uh, food systems, um, important for health and nutrition, important for saving our uh, planet, are of crucial importance right now. I'm just coming from another seminar and I would like to uh, uh, say something about it. And I'm also very happy to see and recognize many members of the uh, stakeholders of countries in the region uh, from the scaling up nutrition movement, civil society, focal points, multi uh, sectoral platforms, multi stakeholders, uh, etc. This is the time to come together around our food systems. And I don't mean the global food system. I mean your own country food system and maybe your regional uh, food system. Why? Because the COVID-19 has learned us hard lessons. Not only how vulnerable uh, we as people are, but also that our food system is not fit for purpose. It is failing already millions for uh, years. But in this crisis, it is, it, it is even more um, uh, clear that we need to do something about uh, making sure that food is serving people, is nourishing people, but if food is also not spoiling our planet further. And for this reason, this e-course learning is so crucial at this time. And you all participants have made the right choice. Now, how to take it from there, from here, because I was also able to have a look at the Q&A. And there were many questions on how can FAO support us, how do we do this, etc. There was also some criticism about why not um, having the, um, the circulation, circular economy when it comes to food, for instance, through organic uh, food, etc. It is all great, but my invitation to you as participants is don't criticize, but take it as an opportunity. Your questions can be brought to the table in your own country. The food systems dialogues will happen or are happening soon in your countries, because um, there will be a food system summit hosted by the Secretary General of the UN, uh, who is bringing uh, together all stakeholders, but it wants to see concrete commitments and actions from countries. And to prepare this, every country, including your country, is um, invited to organize food systems dialogues, three in a row. One, to make sure that you have the right stakeholders around the table, including uh, uh, societies, communities, civil society, private sector, UN uh, investors, uh, and uh, what have you, and make and look at your food system and put on the table a concrete proposal on how to improve this, including agroecology, including food loss and waste, including connection to markets, including fair income for uh, uh, farmers, including uh, the, the, the smart choices for uh, consumers and accessibility and affordability of uh, food. It can all be brought to the table, but it is in our hands, it is in your hands to take it from a county perspective. And of course you can ask FAO what FAO is doing. FAO is there for you. Just as the scaling, uh, uh, scaling Up Nutrition Movement is there for you. Because one thing is clear, it is impossible to drop global solutions on every country and solve every everything from a global perspective and funding alone will not do the trick. This is about people and by people, making sure that all stakeholders are recognized 
and that solutions that are brought to the table to make our uh, food system both serving our health and nutrition and mitigating climate change, safeguarding uh, our biodiversity or improving soils or natural resources, mitigating uh, 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 big problems and, and potential conflicts because of uh, climate change. Um, and we can do it now. And for that reason, I would like to invite all more than 262 participants right now to have a look at your country, in your country, or to reach out to the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement or FAO to um, get more information on how you can get connected to this food systems dialogues at your country so that you, with all your wisdom, your ambition, your expertise can contribute to solutions that will serve our generation, next generation, but also keep our planet livable for the next, next, next generations. And with this, I would like to thank all involved and uh, wish you a very good uh, day. Thank you for participating, but take this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerda, and I think that these are excellent concluding remarks. I would like to ask you all to please stay tuned. We, we, um, we will be organizing many other webinars, and in particular, we are organizing, uh, just as a follow-up to what Gerda has just mentioned, we are organizing a 24-hour global uh, marathon for sustainability. Uh, it will be at actually done uh, on the 22nd of April, which is the uh, United Nations International Mother Earth Day. And we have been mobilizing people from civil society, governments, but also uh, citizens, uh, young entrepreneurs to try to share for us, with us, their concerns, their good practices, their ideas related to sustainability. So this is very much linked to, to what you were mentioning, Gerda, and this is going to be organized in the 24 time zones throughout the world. We are, we are now gathering all the experts and all the participants who will be um, re, um, um, basically providing some support to, for, for ideas related to sustainability. So thank you all very much for your time, your availability, and we really look forward to see you in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.